There are stories, significant stories. Stories that are in danger of being erased with the passage of time. These tales of bravery, alive in the minds of intrepid activists and in the relationships shared between these warriors, transcend subjective experiences, marginalized perspectives, and tell a truly human story. Your story, my story, our story. Though possibly neglected by the greater society today, the trajectory of recent history proclaims that future generations will want these stories and deserve these stories. Today, we emphatically proclaim that these stories will not perish. Today, these stories will be heard. Today, we celebrate the strength and persistence of those who came before us. Of those who refuse to remain invisible, unseen, and unheard. The audacity to proclaim, this is who I am. I exist, I live, I love. No one can take that away from me. Today, we celebrate the boldness of the individuals who stood for our rights and fought for them in the name of love. We celebrate the nerve of those who struggled for us to exist as authentic members of our communities. We celebrate because our history is human history. It is powerful, heartbreaking, and inspirational. This history is in danger of being lost to time. It is up to us to document the stories of those who came before us in order to empower those who came after us. We are the Spectrum Archives and these are our narratives of courage. Hi, my name is Joanna Michaels. I was born May 1st, 1947. That makes me 69. I'm a good at math. And I was born in Joliet, Illinois. I identify as a woman and I, um, I identify as a demisexual. Um, the way I put it is I love my wife and that's about it. For me, can you um, can you explain uh, what demise demise demisexual is? You have a emotional attraction to somebody, and my wife is 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 the only one I feel an emotional attraction, and uh, so it would be very hard for me to imagine there's anybody that could replace that. Can you explain what's the issue with pronouns and which pronoun you prefer to use? Well, the issue is to um, get people to understand who we are and that regardless of what they think, it's important for them to recognize who we are and to use the correct pronouns. I use she and her, and uh, I ran bars for years, so I use hey you as well. I grew up in Illinois, outside of Chicago. It was Joliet, Illinois. And you got to remember it was in the 50s, and... Um, it wasn't good to be anything but heteronormative, you know, male, female, and um, a good Christian Catholic. So uh, if you were anything else, uh, you were subject to scrutiny and, and you could feel that somehow it was wrong. So at an early age, um, I knew who I was. I just didn't know how to, you know, identify it with names or descriptions or definitions. I just knew that I was drawn to playing with girls, playing girls' games, 
and that my parents would always redirect me. In order to get accepted, to get love from my family, I had to be who they wanted me to be. And so at a pretty early age, um, I started to uh, try really hard to be the boy they wanted and not the girl I was. My name is Tina Reynolds. I am 67 years old. I was born on October 8th, 1948. And I was born in Los Angeles and then moved to Sacramento when I was 10. I'm a woman. I, I identify as a lesbian. Um, in the past 10 years, I have moved more towards queer. When I'm talking to people outside my community, I say I'm gay. Um, it's just I'm picking whichever words they're going to hear, not what I'm going to hear. I don't have to be steadfast in, in the words that I talk about myself. What I'm really trying to do is to get others to embrace a community. And so I'll, I'll customize my words depending on who I'm talking to. So let's talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges for lesbians and what it was like being in the bars and maybe what it how it was different being a lesbian versus being a gay man. So in the 90s, I'm just coming out, 92. I don't know that there's been this, um, this uh, separation between the men and the women. I think I come from a community where men and women are together and we do things together. And now I'm put into the situation where um, there are lots of angry lesbians because they don't get any credibility in the queer movement. It is all the men, all the time. If women are working with men, the men are gonna get the media, the men are gonna get the money, the men are gonna uh, represent the whole community. It's, it's uh, just this thing that happens. And then there's HIV AIDS, and women start showing up to help them. These are men that have been kicked out of their houses, they have no families and nobody's helping. So the women step up and start embracing the dying men and letting them stay in their homes and being the caregivers and running for food. And the men were helping too, but the women really stepped up and changed the way that we relate to the men. And suddenly the men were really needing the lesbians to come and help them. They really needed our help. So that broke down all kinds of walls for the men and women. High school was a, a different story for me because I, I didn't really know what was wrong with me. I hate to use that word, but I knew there was something different. And I knew that I, I liked looking at guys. Was that kind of the when you started realizing it? Or was yes. It prior? No, about that time. It was in high school. And I didn't know what that meant, you know? No one else shared the same feelings. And it's so interesting that today we have these gay straight alliance clubs all over the country, even in Roseville. It's amazing. But in for me, growing up in the 60s in high school in Kansas City, Missouri, Midwest, I literally had no one to talk to. I was afraid to talk to my parents. I was afraid to talk to teachers. I was afraid to talk to any friends, um, minister. I just had to keep it all inside. And, and even going from high school to college, it was that way. So I went up to college, and the college had a series of lectures that would come to the college to speak a, a wide variety of things. And this one particular guy was a minister who said he was the chaplain of a homophile organization. And I thought, homophile? What is a homophile? I've never heard that term before. But it was the term that was used in the 60s before gay and lesbian term became popular. There are homophile organizations all over the country. And he said, you know, Gay people are no different from straight people. They're teachers, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're ditch diggers, they're the mothers and fathers, daughters and son. And all of a sudden the light came on. Oh, I get it now, you know? And so he was talking about this 
this um, gay community center in my hometown of Kansas City I didn't know existed. So I could hardly wait to spring break to go back to my hometown of Kansas City, visit what was called the Phoenix Society, and, and I had a chance to meet other gay people, other people like me. I was just, I was thrilled. And it was there that I met one special person whose name is Ron Bentley. We decided to move to San Francisco. We were, we were young, we were in the 20s, and we were expecting him to live to, you know, old age. But we also were realistic, and we realized that anything could happen to either one of us, and we'd have no protection. So we decided the wills were necessary. So we went to an attorney and had the wills made up, and then the attorney said something really bizarre, strange. And Ron and I looked at each other like, did you hear what I heard? And we asked him to repeat it. And the attorney said, you know, if you really want to protect yourself, I would suggest that one of you adopt the other. What? I thought that was a very strange request. It didn't sound right. Why would two adult men adopt one another? It didn't make any sense to us. But he's an attorney. He probably knows what he's talking about. So we went ahead and did it. And um, we just put the adoption papers and the wills and the cupboard and never thought anything more about it. Um, later, when uh, Ron was um, getting sick, this was back in, he died in 94, uh, my agency I was working for at the time, I asked them if I could take sick leave uh, in order to take care of him. And um, they said no. I said, but he's my partner of 26 years. We've been living together for all this time. And, you know, he's like a spouse to me and blah, 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 blah. No. The only people that you can take very, uh, sick leave for is a family member. Oh, I just remembered those adoption papers. And I dug them out. And so I had to bring those adoption papers in uh, to prove that he was my adopted father and I was able to get sick leave and bereavement leave. And it's interesting now, thank God for the U.S. Supreme Court for ruling marriage equality in all 50 states, but that's the kind of acrobatic tricks that gay couples had to do back then in order to protect themselves and protect themselves as a couple. Hi, I'm Clarmundo Sullivan, and I identify as um, same gender loving. I recall um, another challenge with being gay. I had to decide whether I was a black gay man or a gay black man. Um, being a black gay man meant that I had I, my first allegiance and my first loyalty was my cultural identity. So. If my cultural identity is saying that homosexuality is, is wrong and it's sinful um, and then I have to be strong and masculine and da-da-da-da-da, that's primary and that's what I need to subscribe to and so I have to, I have to make my sexual orientation secondary. If I identify as a gay black, no, yeah, as a gay black man, what I'm doing is I'm telling my two major institutions, fuck you. You know, I am who I am, I was created this way, and I'm gonna live my life as an openly gay man. Um, and that's a very courageous thing to do because we needed to please, we needed to be accepted, we needed to normalize, you know, we, need, we wanted to be treated the same. And so what that meant for a lot of black gay men, even today, is that I'll never forfeit my two major institutions over a sexual orientation. I have a lot, to, I have too much to lose. These are the two institutions that have always been there for me. Um, because of uh, the, the, the history of African Americans in this country and the laws oppressing and the restrictions and the challenges, you know, we've been taught you better stick, you know, with these institutions because once you let them go, you don't know what is waiting for you. So what I chose to do um, is I, I originally chose to be a gay black man. I felt that people should love me for who I am 
And if you don't love me for who I am, then that means you have a problem. It's not my problem. So um, there were benefits with those of us who identified as gay black men. The advantage of that is that we inherited a, a, a community who understood the struggle of being a sexual minority. They understood how it felt like to be marginalized and vilified and demonized. And, uh, you know, so th there was a shared community kind of a thing. And I liked that. I liked that I had this support um, from this community if and when I decided to come out. Um, the other advantage of being identified as a gay black man is um, a lot of the HIV prevention attention was in the gay community. So if I identify as gay, that means that I'm out and that means that um, I'm involving myself in the LGBTIQ community. And so that's where I started seeing messages about safer sex and about HIV and AIDS. But if, if I chose to identify as a black gay man, a black gay man is never gonna be seen at a gay party or at a gay bar or anything gay because you stand the chance of being outed. But the bad news about that is that a, a large group of those individuals didn't get the message about HIV prevention. And so a lot of those individuals continued on safe sex practices and ultimately became infected with HIV and AIDS. So, you know, it's so, you know, I, I think a lot of people don't understand something as simple as how you identify could mean you know, huge consequences for individuals. My name is Rosanna Herber. Uh, well, I was born in Fort Wayne, Indiana on October 1st, 1957. So that makes me 58 years old. My family was poor. We went to Catholic schools because our family was Catholic and it was very conservative. Uh, I knew I was a lesbian from a very young age. And I didn't know that there was anything wrong with being a lesbian. There were two women who lived down the street from us who I happened to babysit for, and they were lesbian. And they didn't talk about being lesbian normally, but I happened to overhear a conversation. And it was like in that instant, I knew I was just like them. And that's when I told my mother, and she kind of freaked out, and I just denied it, said, oh, I'm just teasing mom, it's no big deal. And it never came up again until much later when I was in college. I think political activism is one of the most important things that changes the world. You know, you can't change people's minds at first, you know, if they are very opposed to homosexuality. And it does take sometimes personal contact with people to change their views, much more than laws. But if you don't have the laws for the protection at first, you never make headway with the other. Sacramento uh, started Cat Pack, uh, which was the, the California, let's see, we called it the California Area Capital Political Committee, something like that. And of course, we're not saying we're gay, but, but we were gay and we were out. Well, Cat Pack um, did, a, did a lot for this community on various levels. The first level was that we were able to come together as gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people. Um, people who were Democrat, people who were Republican, and people who were, you know, leaders in the community. And um, we started contributing to campaigns of people who were um, LGBT friendly. And what happens is that it starts weeding out those people who are not um, aligned with what I call democratic values. Uh, and, you know, most of the Republican folks back then just had a real problem with LGBT, didn't even wanna, didn't even wanna go there, didn't want our money, didn't wanna talk about it. But if you're dealing with a lot of Democratic candidates, some were friendly to LGBT and some weren't. 
So the money that we raised really did have an impact on electing folks who were um, gay friendly. And so Cat Pack gave our community political power. Um, Cat Pack was our first opportunity to stand together and say, you've got to look at us, you have to see us. We're here, we're queer, and we're not going away, you know. I was the first publisher and um, first woman publisher for a gay and lesbian newspaper. And so I went to a lot of the national meetings and um, was active with the Gay Press Association and then local press associations. How did you come to name the magazine? Oh. Or the newspaper, I'm sorry. Well, um, when the advocate interviewed me, you know, I thought about, oh, calling it River City Gay Times or Sacramento Gay Times or, you know. And I said, oh, I just can't have the word gay in there because the community is not ready for it, being that open. So we had a, a staff meeting here out in the front room and everybody was here um, right at the beginning, you know, and um, people that were interested. So I invited everybody over. And I said, we need to think of a name for the paper. And, um, and I said, you know, something interesting like Mother Jones. And But, you know, I didn't, wasn't trying to encourage them to use the word mother or anything. But I was just throwing out some different names that were unique and different. So, and we were all smoking dope. So we were very creative. And I, everybody had index cards. I gave everybody index cards. So they would write down one word or a phrase or something. And, all of a sudden, but all of a sudden, somebody in the group—I don't remember who—I think it was James Graham—said, "Let's call mom. Guess what? That's the process that we go through. We always tell our moms first, you know. And so let's call it that. It, it you know, I, I really came out the day the paper came out. <laughs> Can you describe what it was that pushed you? Um, to start the paper? Well, the first thing was to educate everybody about No on Six, the proposition. But also, I wanted gay people, our subtitle, it was uh, a gay and lesbian paper and their straight friends. And that was our little line that went under the logo. And I really wanted to educate straight people that we were lawyers and and senators and business owners and chefs and, you know, all that. It was real important to me to um, start interviewing people that were uh, gay or lesbian and um, educating straight people about our lifestyle and that we were just as normal as they were. And that was a hard road to take, you know, it that lasted a good 10 years. Uh, what were some of your fears? I think my biggest fear in the beginning were the death threats that we were getting, although I kind of took it fairly lightly, but the police and the sheriff department would give me little talks, you know, like, Linda, don't take this lightly, you know. Um, so but, can you can you describe the death threats? Well, like one was the Williams brothers, which was not too long ago. Um, they had a list of people that they wanted to murder there were 10 people and I was on the list. And um, they burnt down one of our city council members' homes. Um, they pretty much did something bad to everybody. Um, but I, I was still part of seven people left on the list. So that's what started the police protection. And that's when they were sleeping here and cars were everywhere. And, I still have, if I call 911, it's just instant. Uh, um, they know it's me and they immediately say, what's wrong? And um, so if I you know, had a problem or somebody at the counter that was, you know, jumping the counter or being weird or something, I would just call and the police would be there just instantaneous. They really took care of us in a great way. I went to Baptist Bible College. I was there for three years. I went to one of my uh, class, wasn't a classmate, he was a schoolmate. He was, uh, he was gone my first year, but he came back the, uh, my second year, was uh, Jerry Falwell, 
who later established the moral majority and became a big uh, political force here in uh, the United States and somewhat around the world. Uh, Jerry and I were very good friends in, uh, during my college years. <laughs> Jerry and I, our paths crossed again here in Sacramento. Uh, Jerry had been invited. We used to have a, 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 a television program on Channel 3 called Early Morning Talk Show called Look Who's Talking. And uh, Falwell was over in San Francisco in, in uh, July of 1984, just prior to the uh, Democratic National Convention harassing the Democrats. And um, look who's talking, invited him over to Sacramento to be on the program, and he came over. Some of the, one of the producers knew, was a friend of Tim's, and knew that I had gone to school with Falwell, and they wanted me to be in the audience. A host came by to me, and Jerry acknowledged that we'd gone to school together, and little chit chat. And I then asked him about a quote that he had made in, on his uh, old time Gospel Hour program. So I'd seen it in The Advocate. And I figured it was just something he'd said in a prayer meeting or something. I didn't expect to see it on, on, on his national television pro program. And I, I worked nights at a motel and I came home and he was on like at eight o'clock in the morning and I had, was watching the program. And lo and behold, here he comes up with this quote. And I was, I was really shocked. And I ran out to uh, Sears and bought a little tape recorder. And he was on three times a day here in different stations here in Sacramento. So I, uh, Caught him the next time he was on, and I recorded him making that statement. But anyway, I, I went to the went to the was in the audience that morning. I was on Friday, the July thirteenth, nineteen eighty four, and as I say, Jim Fennerty came around and Falwell recognized me, and so I started asking him about this this statement that he'd made on on the old time gospel hour, and I said, "You uh, were preaching," and I said, "You made a statement about the Metropolitan Community Churches." in which you said they were brute beasts, part of a violent satanic system that would one day be annihilated and there'd be a celebration in heaven. And of course, he kept interrupting me, saying, I never said that, I never said that, I never said that. And finally, I said, well, I got a recording of it. And you could tell, when you see the videos, you could tell he just became unglued. And he said, I'm saying this on television in front of all these people. You produce the tape, I'll give you $5,000. And I said, well, I don't have the tape on me. Well, of course you don't. But I, I uh, called, uh, 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 I'd left the tape at home. I, I called uh, MCC, called LA, and said, send me that tape. And I had my tape. And I took both of them down to the television station the next, next week. And they played the tapes and made a newscast out of it and, and basically agreed that I had quoted him accurately, that he probably owed me the money. And so I went to Rosie Matrailer, a lesbian attorney here in town. I said, I want you to write Falwell and tell him to send a check back by return mail. <laughs> send us our check. And we got a letter back from, from his attorney basically saying it'll be a cold day and you know where before I send you $5,000 and you'd altered the tape and you'd, you'd all sorts of, of nutty things. And uh, so in, on October, no, November 30th, uh, he was back here in Sacramento uh, on a moral majority uh, meeting uh, that they were having down at the convention center. And Rosie went to court and filed a uh, lawsuit against him for breach of oral contract that he had made a deal with me and I had performed what he asked me to do and he, he had refused, he had reneged on paying me. Um, the reporters were already out there uh, to, to meet him and so he was, he, we were out on a special area of the tarmac where he came in on his little private jet. It cost umpteen million dollars. Uh, and uh, as soon as he, his plane was coming coast in, we passed out our press releases saying we'd filed this lawsuit against him. We had our process ser server there, and as soon as he got off the plane, our processor said, uh, Reverend Falwell, and handed this paper, and Jerry said, give it to this guy. And so we did, but he was served. And um, the next day, the Sacramento Union particularly had a big story on the front page about our lawsuit and, and uh, his uh, problems that he had while he was here in Sacramento. Uh, we eventually went to court, and it was agreed in court that uh, nobody needed to testify that everything the judge needed to see was on tape, or audio tape or videotape, 
we were able to obtain videotapes from his offer at uh, Channel 3. We uh, got those tapes and they had his tapes and so on. The judge looked at all that, ruled in my favor, and said he owed the, owe you the money. Um, Falwell appealed the case on the basis that we had a Jewish judge that was prejudiced against him. And, of course, the, the appeals court judges really like that. That, that, that has a... Has a uh, reason to appeal and they of course denied his appeal said they'd wasted their time and it was a frivolous lawsuit and they assessed another twenty seven hundred dollars against him I eventually just just uh, 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 got to just a few dollars short of of nine thousand dollars and uh, uh, we then took part of that money and, and used it to also to help open the the gay community center so Falwell was a kind of a reluctant uh, godfather of our of the of the community center so uh, you know over the years now the center has grown and and he's responsible for it <laughs> Par partially responsible my name is George Raya and sometimes people say Raya sometimes people say Raya depends if they're saying it in English or Spanish I respond to both um, I am 67 I was born in Sacramento April 23rd, 1949. And um, my both sets of grandparents come from Mexico, um, so identify as Mexican. The name changes, you know, it was Mexican, Chicano, Latino, so. Because <laughs> it used to be gay, then gay lesbian, now it's LGBT. So things changed over the years, but when I was born, we identified as Mexican. I didn't accept the stereotypes of being a Mexican, so when I came out as gay, I definitely was not going to accept the stereotypes and negativity about being gay. So it, 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 it was one of the grounding forces that really helped me be gay and out. See, I came out in 69, 68, 69. We had a sheriff, Sheriff John Misterly, who was could have fit in the South, very old, mean, and um, all of the gay bars, prostitution, gambling, was in West Sacramento. You know, this side of town was supposed to be clean. Uh, so when we wanted to go out, we had to go across the river. Everybody was in the same bar. It was college students, blue collar, white collar, women, people from the Air Force bases, um, it was one community. It was really great. And I remember every time I'd go out, I'd be very excited to see, okay, who else is gay? You know, because you wouldn't, Willie really would know unless you saw them there at the bar. If you saw them at the bar, if they're gay, you know. Um, so it was always exciting to see, oh, wow, he's gay too. Um, and Harvey Milk, I knew him in San Francisco, said one time, bars are our community centers. That's where we go to meet people in the community, that's where we go to find out the latest news, because newspapers didn't have any gay news, we heard it word of mouth. And that's where you went to organize, you, you know, did your petitions, your fundraising, your voter registration campaigns at gay bars. So bars were our home, our safe area, especially if you lived in a place like San Fernando or San Fernando Valley, a non-gay friendly area, you knew you were safe at a gay bar, you could let your hair down. Okay, so bars were important and they generated a lot of money for us and a lot of voter power. Can you talk about um, why it was so um, underground and um, just kind of held within the bars and within the home? Well, because we were unapprehended felons. Um, the state was real specific as to what kind of sexual conduct was permissible. Uh, sodomy or copulation was against the law. The state, on statute, it was the missionary position was the only thing allowable. Uh, and unfortunately, they were not enforced against the general public, but just against the gay community. Uh, and at one time, they actually tried to make it legislatively so. Um, but that's, that's another story for another time. But, uh, if you got caught, arrested, you would become a registered sex offender. Okay? Uh, you know, the ministers, we were sinners. Uh, the psychologists, we, were, we had mental illness. Because you know? if you looked up 
homosexuality in the textbooks, it was under abnormal psychology. Uh, when I came out, I read, I went to the library because I wanted to read everything I could find about homosexuality, you know, understand all this and stuff. Um, and I went to the library at the campus, and the bibliography for, for homosexuality was really short. But one of the books was a, a law review article written by a professor from Cal Western, which is a law school in San Diego, and so this would be about 1970, and it was called Why the Status Quo. And what he did was he talked about what the law was, what the history was, where it came from in England and all that. And he ended the article by saying, nothing would change unless gay people themselves step forward to work to change the law. And that, that was the whole theme of the article, why the status quo. Because no one was going to hand us our rights. We would have to literally come out of the closet and go to court pick it, you know, all the other, because this was the time of all, all the civil rights movement and stuff. So that really sunk in. So you were discussing how you had mixed feelings about your ceremony. Well, not, certainly not doubt, because, right, yeah, right. it was all positive. It just was kind of different, because on the positive side, it did just what Mike and ultimately, I hoped it would. It brought us even closer. To him, it made the relationship way more meaningful and way more permanent, and any doubts now dispelled. Because he knows when I said what I said, I meant it. The other thing that it did, however, was it left me really pissy and dissatisfied about the fact that we'd had to go through this commitment ceremony and it wasn't legal. And quite frankly, I'd been preoccupied with other things. I'd been preoccupied with AIDS. I'd been preoccupied with discrimination. Lesbians, if they tried to get an apartment and the guy asked them the nature of their relationship, if they didn't lie, he wouldn't give them the apartment. The Sutter Club wouldn't allow women members and certainly wouldn't let an openly gay person. So there were things around this town that had to be changed. So I never dreamed, frankly, of attacking marriage until after our commitment ceremony. And then I said to Mike, we need to get involved in the effort to provide marriage opportunity for same-sex couples. Because now we know that what we've been saying, what activists have been saying all the time, is true. It does make a difference. It makes a difference to you, to us, to actually f be married. It means more to your kids. It means more to, you know, and, and I had begun advising people about adoption and how to come out later in life that people were sent to me for that reason. And so I, I felt that whole thing about what marriage would do and that really propelled us then after our commitment ceremony. And uh, <laughs> later, uh, several years later, can't remember the exact year, uh, Gavin Newsom made it clear, we're going to make have marriages in City Hall. We're going to test this whole business because I think it's unconstitutional to deny, to deny marriage. So I, as mayor of San Francisco, say, come here and get married. Well, we were on the way to San Francisco to give a speech. I was supposed to give a speech at Golden Gate University. And this was on NPR. And Mike said, why don't we go to the city hall and get married? And I said, well, I don't think it's gonna be legal yet, but he said, I think we should do it. We should be a part of this. This is a momentous thing. So I said, okay, my speech will be over by two. Let's go over there. Well, we went over there. There was a line all the way around the city hall in San Francisco. And I was a little daunted at first. And Mike said, I don't care if it's midnight. Let's go stand in that line. Well, that in itself was a joyous occasion because people from all over started bringing us, <laughs> I'm getting emotional again. People started bringing us flowers and food and water and stood in line with us and talked. And people would come up and make sure you had somebody to stand up with you. In fact, two kind of leather guys came up to us and said, do you have anybody to stand up with you? And we said no, and they, so they stayed with us. Well, when we finally got to the door, it was four o'clock, and they had scheduled a wedding in there that they couldn't cancel. So they came down the line and said, here's a number, if you'll come back tomorrow, we'll put you right back where you were. 
And the next day we came back, got her place in Lane, went in, and people had come in and been deputized to marry. And we, when we went in, it was our turn, this short uh, lesbian gal who's vice president of a major winery, very uh, highly successful woman, had just said, I want to be part of this. So she had herself deputized, took her little card, and said, you see that place at the top of the stairway up in the city hall where the shaft of light is coming through that circular window? I want you to stand in that shaft of light. Your boy is on either side of you. I'll stand here, and I'm going to marry you in that place. It was like all of a sudden you've been in the San Francisco City Hall. It's kind of like a cathedral. So you're standing in this pool of light, holding hands, and this little gal whom you've never met before is thinking this is the most important thing she'll ever do in her life. She's just thrilled. And these two guys are just thrilled to be there and be part of this. Next thing you know, she uses a kind of a common civil ceremony, marries us, we go down, get the certificate, they've got everything organized perfectly, and when you go out, the East steps, holding hands, a whole coterie of people have gathered now to throw flowers, rice, uh, cheer and clap and carry on. It, it's hard to even uh, describe how festive and supportive it was. Uh, one of the things that the, um, the Spectrum Committee noticed was this, the obstacle that's unique to LGBT students is um, uh, isolation. And indeed, typically our LGBT students go home to parents who aren't like them. That's part of the LGBT story. We really are the Harry Potter story. We're raised by people who, to a certain extent, are like, aren't like us. And at puberty, we reach this sort of stage where we start to realize that. And we start to feel alienated from our families. And there, there's a huge risk about coming out. When you tell someone that you're LGBT, when you tell your family members, you could lose your entire family. Another student came to see me uh, one day in my office, and I was sharing an office with my friend Megan Seeley, who teaches sociology. And she was there too, and I asked the students if that was okay, and she said yes. Um, but she said she was completely alone. She had no friends. and she leaned forward in the chair and she said, I need friends. And I remember Megan turned around and she had tears in her eyes and it's like, yeah, this is what the students experience. They, they've got no one around them that is reaching out uh, a hand. We, uh, we knew we needed to establish a pride center. So Ryan Perino was the one who came to me and he said, you know what, I want a pride center. And it was at that point that I looked at Ryan and I said, I think this is gonna be your Occupy moment. We are not gonna get a Pride Center because this campus does not have space. We don't have any spare rooms. So I went to then Vice President of Instruction, Deb Sutton. No, she was still the Dean. I went to De Deb and said, uh, we want to establish a Pride Center. And she looked at me and she said, okay. The college gave us a room. They gave us no money for that room but they gave us a room, a space. So we had an empty room. So we knew that we needed to raise money to stock the Pride Center. But those students are in that room continually and they build lifelong relationships in there and they support each other in there and it gives students a place to belong where they're missed by name if they're not there. And that really punctures that isolation that the students build. So that Pride Center is crucial. We are seeing more and more students who come into the college who have their family support. Their family is very supportive. They have their legs. They're confident. They're competent. They're doing well in their studies. And they're taking on leadership positions on campus. Uh, we still do, though, have far, far too many students who are coming in and experiencing not having their legs. And we did have, in 2011, we had a student who came from a local high school. He was only at Sierra College one semester the fall. And on New Year's Day, he hung himself. Now we know he had never made contact with our Rainbow Alliance. He didn't access any of our services. So since then, we've started printing up the services we have for LGBT students, a beautiful color trifold. And we send it out to the high schools and make sure that we're trying to do away with the gap. So students, as soon as they get there, can know where to go. But we want no more of those students. 
we want no more. And interestingly enough, I think that that is completely common ground. I don't care who may be opposing certain movements that we take on campus. Everyone agrees that if one of our students is suffering so badly that he or she wants to take his life, his or her life, that that's untenable. And we need to find some way to reach the student. We have an entire history to capture, document, and store. It is up to us to show our communities that our history matters. The Spectrum Archives is focusing on the collective LGBTQIA history in the Sacramento and broader regions of California. Our goal is to create an archive where anyone can access the histories we have documented thus far. Our goal is big and expensive. We need your help to see it through. Anyone who texts the word PRIDE to 50555 will make a $10 donation to Spectrum. Our collective voice will empower our future generations to protect our rights and continue the effort toward equality. We encourage you to start an oral history project in your own town. Connect with us and create a quilt of LGBTQIA narratives globally. Document the courageous stories that prompted our collective journey. Thank you for your support, the Spectrum Archives team.